this project is um, an observation of the moon through the month of November, and it culminated in a gallery um, exhibition um, that showed all of the phases of the moon uh, to the general public. And so the reason behind this was that I wanted to highlight something that most people don't take the time to observe in great detail because it is always available to them. Um, and so that was the reasoning behind this project, and I will start off with a couple of astronomers and inventors in the realm of photography and how that transitioned from photography from being a um, very cumbersome large thing to the digital cameras that we often think of today. Um, and then I will go into depth about my process and a little bit about the costs um, and what I learned about um, the general composition, but also photography in an extent. Um, so our first person is Johannes Hevelius, who lived from 1611 to 1687. He was an astronomer who made an atlas of the moon, um, which consisted of detailed drawings of many different phases, but also um, large um, sketches of what it looks like at different times of the year and different phases. Um, and then he went on to observe some of the stars as well, and he analyzed uh, 1,564 stars and their location and um, where they were in the constellations. And that was actually how this was um, organized in the um, book and all of this was later combined into by after his death into a large atlas called Podromenus Astronomy in 1690. Next we have Joseph uh, Joseph Nicephor Nicephi, who lived between 1765 and 1833. He was a French inventor um, and but also a photographer and he looked at the idea of a heliograph which is a plate of metal co coated with bitmutin um, and then placed an engraving over that and the spaces where the sun allowed to hit the metal and the bitmutin caused a reaction and that was what caused the print to be on a piece of metal. And so then um, the only downside of this was that there was an extreme, extremely long um, exposure time and so it just wasn't practical uh, and so that caused further and many other uh, photographers to experiment with different ways you can do that, which I will touch on later. Um, but he then also went on to experiment with if you could use a different type of metal or a different type of um, thing that the sun would react with. And so he achieved that and in 1822, he um, found that you could use asphalt on glass and it would do a similar thing to the bit mutant. Um, and so then we have um, a little bit about the history of the camera as it transitioned from being an obscure camera, which was um, just a black box with a pinhole in it, um, to being these very elaborate digital cameras that we have today. So the first person that we will look at is Frederick Scott Archer, who lived between 1813 and 1857. Who He was an English photographer, and he invented the idea of a photographic uh, collagen process, which um, preceded the modern gelatin um, emulsion process that we use today when we are exposing film and the process that occurs after that. Um, and so then this allowed the process to be um, easily reproducible, producible because there was a fairly low um, exposure time, which was a major problem with uh, Nisepi's work, um, as even though it was advanced for his time. Um, so this, how this worked was he coated a glass plate with a Caldean solution, and that was exposed um, and, well, it was wet, which allowed the exposure times, as I already mentioned, to be greatly reduced, but it also allowed this process to be uh, given to the greater public because 
it didn't take quite as long time for the photos to be produced. Um, and this allowed a um, more a rapid expans expansion in all areas of photography, such as the idea of the carte vista um, process, the amber type, and the tin type production, um, are all direct results from what he did in, during his time. Um, and so we have a quote from him, which is the imperfections in paper photography has um, induced me to find some other substance more applicable and meeting the necessary conditions required of it, such as finesse of surface, transparency, and ease of manipulation. So a big part problem with that he had with the previous types of photography was that they weren't able to be manipulated and they weren't able to be reproduced. And he saw that as a problem because then it meant you couldn't send the photos out into the greater public and it also caused them to take a long time to be produced. Um, so then our next person is uh, Johann Zahn, um, who lived between 1641 and 1707. And he was the inventor of the Obscura camera, which I have touched on a little bit, but I will go into greater depth here. He also laid the um, blueprints for a lot of um, camera uh, production and things such as a lens cover and also the idea of having a lens um, that could enlarge but also focus an image. So originally the Obscura camera started off by being a large room or a room that was completely darkened except for a small hole that could be um, from a window. And that really wasn't practical because you were really limited with what you could uh, take photos of. And so he wanted to take that and make it much more practical, um, but also how allow it to be transported um, to the general public which he did by creating the um, Obscura camera, which I've mentioned before, but it is basically just a box that mimics the room by having it be all dark and just a small uh, area that the light, light can shine through. Um, and so uh, the, the lens cover that he had, basically he was able to figure out how to make that by using a lantern, um, and a piece of cloth, and um, that allowed the photographers to be able to change slides um, without potentially damaging anything from the exposure of sunlight. Um, and then, um, so he experimented with all of this and so much more, such as microscopes, telescopes, and um, this was all, all of these blueprints which consisted of descriptions and diagrams and very detailed images um, were all combined into a book called Oculus Artificialis Teleodopterus Su Telescopium. Um, and um, unfortunately, none of the stuff that he actually uh, came up with and um, essentially created the blueprints and drawings for were produced in his time because the majority of the technology required to do that um, was not available until 150 years after his death. Um, and so the next person we will come to is George Eastman and his Kodiak. Um, so originally this idea came from that he was taking a trip and he wanted a to take um, his photography equipment with him, but it ended up being very bulky and very difficult to transport, but also very expensive. Um, not only the, um, to purchase those things, but to transport them anywhere um, because they were quite large and heavy. Um, and so this is where he had the idea of making it all in one container with the lens and the exposure, as you can see in this photo here. Um, and so the, he also wanted to make it able to go into the general public because typically um, a photograph person that has all of the photography equipment is wealthy but also has the time because typically it needed a long exposure time um, but also the time to learn how to use all of this elaborate equipment. Um, and so um, in 1885 he petitioned 
to the petition. He went to the petitioner's office and with this idea of a small uh, roll holding camera. Um, and so this addressed the idea of size, but also cost, because it is much more cost efficient to create something that is small and has all of the parts needed to take the photo in one place. Um, but that also meant that more people could purchase his cameras. Um, and then in 1888, the first Kodiak was launched. Um, and so this was a 100 um, exposure camera. And once all of those 100 photos were taken, you sent the camera back to the company and they developed the photos and then sent them back to you. Um, so it was kind of the idea of that you only had to take the photo, we'll do the rest. Um, which basically allowed more people to um, be able to access and use this camera because they didn't have to have the knowledge of developing the film and how to put insert and take out the film. Um, and then he wanted to keep um, experimenting with how he could make this even more accessible and a much better quality uh, item. And so in 1889, he hired a chemist named Henry, Henry Reichenbach to develop a type of flexible film that would be seen in like the uh, 1900s, but also today when you think of a, when you purchase a roll of film. Um, this allowed it to be much more easily accessible to insert, but also to remove the film from the camera. Um, so next we'll talk a little bit about the materials that I used and my procedure. So I decided to use a Canon parachute um, and um, the reason why is because when people think of taking photos of the moon, they think you need um, a large camera with these large lenses, which are rather expensive to pr uh, purchase, but also to maintain. Um, and so this camera, while it is on the rather inexpensive side, has a large and um, amazing quality zoom um, for this small camera, but I also wanted to demonstrate to the public that you can um, take photos using to um, take well quality, good quality photos with using a small camera and a um, things that you might have around at home, such as a digital camera, but also your printer, so you can make print these very elegant prints with the materials you have at home. Um, and so. That was the reason why I chose that camera. Um, and um, then also I decided to use my own printer that I have here at my house because um, it is something that is generally, um, people think you can't use your own equipment. You have to hire out to a professional to get the best quality prints you can. And I wanted to see how um, professional of a quality of print I could get by using my own printer. And so here you can see the printer in a little bit more depth, but also you can see the general costs. And so the total cost was 560, with the majority of it going towards the printer and the ink, just because of general upkeep, but also because the photos were 11 by 17, um, they needed to be um, quite large, which required um, more ink than a normal photo might but also because the image that I was taking was of the moon. And um, so on the photo that I pr um, printed, there would be a whole lot of black and just one center of the moon. Um, and so to have that much black requires a lot of ink and therefore the ink costs were rather expensive. Um, and then you have the general cost of paper and frames and I decided to frame my own. Um, yet again for cost, but also um, for time as well, just because typically when you send it to a professional, uh, it takes quite a bit of time. Um, and so here is my process. Um, and the photos were taken during the month, Nova month of November, as I've mentioned earlier. And the reason why I chose that was because you have a full moon on the 1st and a full moon on the 31st. So one can see the... Um, full transition of all of the stages of the moon, um, but they can also see it not just one day at a time, but how it looks um, 
as an overall image altogether. So you can really see how it is changing and how that is what you might see, but you don't look past it other than the moon has changed today. Um, and the reason why I took them at 3 a.m. is because I observed when um, people would be up and you, typically you have the night owls and then you have the early risers. And so 3 a.m. is typically a time when they both are not um, up. And the reason why I looked for a time when there were not a lot of people awake was because the more light pollution you have, um, the less detail you will get on the moon. And I was aiming for some rather detailed photos of the moon because I wanted to portray the detail that you might not see from your naked eye, um, but that a camera could pick up or a telescope could pick up. Um, and to really highlight that because people don't generally see that beauty in their daily lives. Um, and then so once I took the photos, I downloaded them onto my computer and I edited them through Lightworks. Um, and that gave me the idea the ability to change the exposure. So I didn't have to have everything on the camera perfect when I took the photo. And I didn't necessarily have to have perfect con conditions either, because if the moon was a little bit blurry one of the days, then I could edit it for um, clarity and definition uh, later in Lightworks. And also with the exposure, you could either uh, darken it or lighten it a little bit. And that both adds clarity um, with the highlights that you see um, but also the dark parts that you might not necessarily see. Um, and the clarity just brings out the craters and um, the general spots that are on that moon that people might not necessarily see. So here is a picture of the exhibition and what it looks in its finality. Um, and what a, a lot of what I learned throughout this process was that you had to really um, work with the person because this is a gallery exhibit and it's in her space. And so it has to be the way that she wants it and um, respecting her space. And if she has any limitations or anything, you, she wants you to respect um, by being it um, the walls. For, like, for example, here, she did not want me to tape onto the walls um, for fear of ruining the paint. And so I had to uh, string them with a piece of wire and use clothespins on that, um, but then also utilizing the metal poles that she had in the space. And so it really um, made me understand what goes into a composition of a piece by um, you might have this image of what you want your uh, work to look like, but then you have the um, space owner's concerns and her um, boundaries that you have to respect. And so it's working with both of those to try and get the final image that you have in your head. Um, so now I will go into depth on the moon and the individual days. Um, and so as you can see here, this is November 1st. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it was a full moon on the 1st and the 30th. And so um, you can see what a full moon looks like, but you can also see the definition. So you can see the craters, but then you can also see the vertexes and the polar forces that are on the moon by the light strings on that image. And I will go into a little bit of depth on what a waning gibbous is and a few of the other stages that are. You will see when I go into depth on each individual image. And so here, um, a waning gibbous is the phase that when the moon shrinks from 99.9 .9 or 99% at a full moon, to um, 51%, which is t considered the third quarter moon. And so it is the shrinkage, but it's also an upward tilt of the moon. And as you can see that when I go through the phases, so here we have November 2nd, and November 3rd, and November 4th, and November 5th, and November 6th, and then we have November 8th. And so here we have a last quarter moon, um, and which basically means that it's half of the moon um, that is lit up. And so it is typically one week after a full moon. 
And so on Earth, we will see the moon half lit, as you can see here. And um, so this means that the because like half of the rest is on the part the far side where we can't um, see it, and this is typically um, is so the last quarter is just a half of the moon at a different image, and it comes one week after the full moon. Um, so it can also be called a third quarter moon. So then we have November 18th. And as you can see the, here, there is some discrepancy because so it's not um, every single day because I was working around clouds and just general storms in the area. So I tried to get the majority of the days as I could, um, but there are still a few when that was um, just not possible. And so then um, we have a waxing crescent here. And November 19th. And um, now we have November 20th, and I will explain the waxing cre crescent, which is basically the moon um, moving towards full, um, so it's going from a new moon to full. Um, um, and so, um, and so it is, it's after the new moon, as I already explained, but it is, the illuminated portion of the moon is slowly increasing, and it gets bigger and bigger, um, until a full moon. So we have November 21st, and a first quarter moon is basically a similar thing to a um, third quarter moon, um, but it is the is typically called the is also called the half moon, um, and because typically from Earth we can see that it is basically exactly half of the moon <coughs> that is illuminated. Um, so now we have November 22nd, and here you can see example of the, how I was working around the clouds and how that affects the, the overall image that you get. And here we have a waxing gibbous, which I have already touched on. Here's November 23rd. And November 24th. November 25th, November 26th, November 27th, and November 28th. And so here you can see 98%. Um, percent. It's essentially a full moon, and this is what we from, uh, from Earth looking at the moon would generally classify as a full moon, even if it is not officially a full moon. Um, so overall in this project, I learned a lot about manipulating camera, such as the exposure and how that changes when it is a full moon, which gives off, gives off a lot more light to um, one of the days immediately after the new moon, where there was only a very tiny little sliver um, available. Um, and so that really allowed me to manipulate the camera and learn how that worked, but then also how you can take that and say you take photos of the moon and how that also applies to uh, taking portraits. Um, thank you for listening and please ask any questions you might have.